loving. So anyway, with all that, let's turn in our Bibles to Psalm 1. Title of our study today, Blessed, Fruitful, and Righteous. If you're wondering, Psalm 1, well, we finished the book of Acts, not really ready to jump into Romans. That'll probably happen at the first of the year, but with Thanksgiving and Christmas and all these other holidays, well, it just makes more sense to look at some things that will be, well, foundational for those of you who are new and amazing reminders for those of you who've walked this walk for decades Psalm 1, blessed, fruitful, and righteous. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree, planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Lord, give us insight and understanding and application today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You should know, you are probably aware God's blessings abound everywhere at all times. His rain falls on the just and the unjust, on the righteous and the unrighteous. The food we eat, the water we drink, the air we breathe are for the most part available to all. And where food's lacking or fresh water unavailable or air barely breathable, that's on us, not on God. We possess the resources, the technology to ensure every living soul has life's basic necessities. Well, Psalm 1 doesn't actually celebrate God's ever-present, manifold, desirable, obtainable, enjoyable blessings. It's not about blessings. It reveals the blessed state, status, and experience of all who know and grow, all who abide and delight in Him. It began with a simple declaration, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. The blessed and the blessed, I like it, blessed. I don't, can't tell you why, maybe because that's old King James, but anyway, they're not led astray by the ever-changing, unproductive, self-destructive, worldly wisdom of ungodly fools. Rejecting the plots and plans, the advice of all God calls ungodly, wicked, evil, enemies of God and men. So we live in a generation unlike any other, a time in history unlike any other, where, well, just 30 years ago or so, You had to actually get published to get your information out there. If you had crazy thoughts, you had to find someone crazy as you who would publish your thoughts for you. But today, anyone can say anything and post it and and get all kinds of, the weirder it is, the more people look at it. And whatever they do afterward, it makes me wonder how this could be any kind of improvement. Experts abound and experts disagree. And he's going to tell us why. Because they're not walking in God's counsel. They're walking in the counsel of the ungodly, of the worldly, of the foolish. Well, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path or the way of sinners. I like the word pathway. Why? Because that's really what we're seeing here. There's a way to stand and there's a path to walk. And by the way, if you're unaware or didn't notice, Psalm 1 contrasts throughout the wise and the foolish. 
the one who's walking with the Lord and the one who's running from the Lord or flat out denying the Lord, nor stands in the pathway of sinners. The blessed don't stand with, for, or like the ungodly. Many of you know Pastor Don Spencer. He worked with us for years and years. He has Spencer Automotive, highly recommended. Uh, rarely do commercials for my friends, but he's someone I can do that for. And, and uh, he had this thing where he was warning when he was our high school pastor, he warned, especially the girls, not to stand hot. And I'm like, uh, well, could you demonstrate exactly what you mean by that? Oh my gosh, why did I ask? I will never get that picture out of my head. You can't unsee that. And, and so Don was just trying to say, listen, there's a way to stand that's not suggestive, that's not enticing, that's not, well, ungodly. And, and, and so he's talking about that very thing, standing in the way of sinners or standing in the path of sinners. Why? If you stand in the path with them, soon you'll be walking that path as well. Well, there's a way that seems right unto man, we're told, but the way or the end of it is the way of death. Follow me, says the fool. And the foolish follow that fool. The Lord says to the wise, this is the way to walk, walk in it. I remember my pastor saying decades ago, the one who won't stand for what's right will fall for anything. And the problem today is so many don't know what's right. They're hearing so many voices and they're, they're getting so much information. And how can you, well, know who to follow, who to believe? He's telling us right here. If they're not walking with him, then they're walking in darkness. They may be a brilliant scientist or they could be in some other field. But the bottom line is, Without the knowledge of God, men are in darkness, doing their best. I don't think every unrighteous person is insincere. I think for the most part, many, if not most of them are sincere. The problem is there are more often than not sincerely wrong. So blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the pathway of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. The seat here means dwelling place. It's not just walking near and standing by, but settled in and fellowshipping with ungodly, unrighteous, rebellious mockers of God and good. We have a perfect example in Lot. You recall him, nephew of Abraham. They traveled together, but God wanted to separate the two Abraham, knowing God had given him all the land that he could see or walk in, he tells Lot, hey, you go for it. Whatever you see, whatever you want, just go take it. And Lot looked toward the fertile plains of Sodom. It looked like it would be a good situation, good for, for uh, you know, the, the work he was doing, the flocks he was leading. And so he moved toward Sodom. And after a time, he moved into Sodom. And by the time the angels come to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, he's moved up in Sodom. He's actually, and this is why it comes up, he's sitting in the seat of the city there by the city gates. What does that mean? He had moved up. He had become a judge with others of the way people lived and what they thought and what they were doing. In fact, when the angels tell him, you need to get everybody who you have influence over and you need to get them out of here, judgment is coming. It says he went and he told those that, that he thought would listen, but they just mocked the idea that judgment would come. So here he is, he's moved toward, he's moved in, he's moved up. He's a politician, if you will there in Sodom and he's sitting in the gate deciding for others and in the midst of that well judgment comes so important to get this because we know we're told judgment is coming again 
And, and just this in Sodom and Gomorrah, it was by fire. God says that's what's going to happen to planet Earth next time. All that can be dissolved will be dissolved. So the only thing that will remain is that which is eternal. Nothing we have, possess, desire, work for, stack up, none of that will survive God's judgment. But people can survive. And the only thing we're taking to heaven with us is other people. So in any case, Lot moves toward, in, and up. And then he has to be literally dragged out of that place before the fire falls. And he barely escaped judgment with his daughters and with his life. But in the process, he lost his wife. And later we learned that, well, you can take the girls out of Sodom, but you can't get Sodom out of the girls. Because they had become like the people they were raised among. They had bought in to some of the, the, the immoral and, and insane ideas of the people they lived among. I'm sure if Lot could look back, he would undo all of that. And some of us might be in a place where we're like, man, if I could look back, if I could go back, if I could change, I would change so many things. Well, here's what we can do. We can look forward and we can make sure that from this day on, we won't be looking back a year from now saying, oh, if only I hadn't, or if only I had, or I should have listened, or I should have responded. I should have set my priorities on God and on his word. Well, he barely escapes, but he did escape. And I'm expecting, well, we'll get to see him someday and say, man, you really made some bad choices, didn't you? But anyway, it says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, stands in the way of sinners or sits in the pathway of, or stands in the um, way of uh, sinners or sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law. And in his law, he meditates day and night. The law here is the Torah. It's the word Torah. It doesn't mean the laws of God, the precepts, the, the judgments. All of those are a part but they're not the heart of what this is talking about. The law he's speaking of here actually is the first five books of Moses. That's what the Torah is. His delight, his desire, his pleasure is in the law of God, the word of God, the Torah, God's word, his testimony, his witness. And in his law, he meditates day and night. The blessed begins and ends the day in the word of God. This is important for us, and here's why. The Torah was all they had at the time this was written. Well, other things had happened, and perhaps those books were, you know, those scrolls were being written, but you didn't have access to them, not initially. And so these first five books, they are the foundation for understanding, well, Almost everything, if not everything, we need to know about who we are and, and who God is and how we got here and why we're here and what happens after we leave planet Earth. The word meditates is an interesting one. Having met Pam down in Newport Beach and lived for a season in Laguna Beach and Huntington Beach and, and Seal Beach, and well, you get the theme. It's called beach. And uh, we had this thing, why do we need a car? Who wants to go inland? And inland to us could be just, you know, f four blocks away from the beach. So in any case, meditate in that day, and it's true for many today, it meant to empty your mind and to just zone out and, and just, well, oh, you know, weird out and an ohm out and uh, every other weird thing that people were doing. It was very popular, especially in Laguna Beach. But meditation biblically is the opposite of that mindset of emptying your mind it's actually filling your mind with the word of God I spent hours and hours and hours meditating on Psalm 1 
Not because I don't understand it or didn't think I was prepared to teach it. I could do that at a drop of a hat. I did that because it was nourishing me. It was strengthening me. It was encouraging me. And if you are in need of any of those things, no, you are not alone. This is a most difficult season for many of us for many reasons and in many ways that we've ever experienced. Well, there's a prescription here then. Want to be wise? Meditate on the word of God. You want to be safe and secure? It's a sure foundation, the truth of God's word. So it begins with ingesting his word. We do that every time we read it. He likens it to food, to fuel. We ingest it by chewing on it. And then those juices mix with it and we begin to swallow it. And and as we do, well, we end up digesting it. Cows, they're a little bit unusual. They digest it and then they bring it back up and then they chew it some more. I don't recommend that as a human. <laughs> it's a, I've never seen food twice and wanted to see it a third time. And so, uh, you, you know, we don't need to go into the details, but, but cows, they actually have a unique system because for them to be fully nourished and because their diet is basically, you know, grass and the things that are out in the field, well, they have that system that allows them to meditate. It's, it's I believe, ruminate on, on that food, and they make sure to get every bit of nourishment from it. It's why people like my wife were always telling the boys and me and now the grandsons and me, chew your food. Of course we're chewing it. We're just chewing fast because it's a competition. It's not a competition for who can eat the fastest. It's a competition for who will get that next piece of whatever it is. And and so... The boys were with us, in fact, the grandsons this uh, last couple days. And, and, and uh, Eli got up very early because, you know, then he has his run of the house. And, and, uh, and we come down and we buy these massive yogurts. Not every kid likes yogurt, but he does. They're massive. He actually ate half of that thing of yogurt, a whole giant thing of strawberries, a whole giant thing of blueberries. And listen, this is first breakfast. This isn't even the breakfast I'm going to make when I get up. And, and, and I don't ever want to discourage him because he's a growing boy, 13 years old now. How weird is that? But he is a growing boy and he needs that fuel. And then when we're sitting at the table, Lou is just wolfing his food. He doesn't, doesn't even appear. He's chewing it at all. And Pam, of course, is like, you need to chew your food and you need to slow down. He goes, hey, I can't slow down. He goes, why? Well, if we're at home and we don't eat it fast and we don't eat it all, our dad eats it. (laughs) So, So anyway, here's the funny part. I remember that myself. That's why we started buying six pork chops. So there were only four of us or seven when I smartened up. But in any case, the idea of just chewing on it and getting every bit of nourishment possible for it. That's what he's talking about. Well, in any case, nourished, instructed, corrected, directed, day and night. That's the picture he gives us. There are some examples of it in literature and elsewhere. That the word is actually used of a lion with its prey. And it's used of a kitten with a mouse. I want to say it ends badly for the prey and the mouse. And maybe this is where the phrase came from, don't play with your food. But they do that. It's actually fascinating. Never watched a lion with, well, maybe on TV, but, but I have watched a kitten with a mouse. And, and they'll like bat it a little and then they'll let it try to get away and then it'll grab it. It's rather fascinating if you've got nothing else to do. And um, if the power's out, hey, it's entertainment. Anyway, a lion with its prey, a kitten with its mouth. Well, the Torah, I mentioned it already, the first five books in the Bible. It's called the law, but it's far more 
than rules and regulations. It's God, God's revelation of who he is and how we came to be and why we exist and what lies ahead. And here's why this is so important. You only get that information accurately in the scripture. Men have all sorts of ideas and theories and propositions about what might have or could have or may have happened, but only God knows exactly what happened because God is responsible for all of it. Unlike the ever-changing ideas and theories and opinions of the ungodly, unrighteous, unholy sinners, it's God's sure and secure, unchanging foundation on which we can build our lives. Now, the Torah was God's gift to Israel initially that they might know him and his will for them. The five books were enough. I'll share with you why here in a moment. It was all they needed to put their faith in him. We have 66 books. They had five. And it was sufficient, God says. And we have the whole picture. We don't just have promises of a Messiah. We have a historical record that Jesus came, born miraculously, lived sinlessly, died on the cross for our sins vicariously. He rose again victoriously, ascended into heaven, having promised that he'd be back for his own. The, the angel proclaims, hey, this same Jesus that you saw go will return in like manner. So Genesis, book of creation. Exodus, book of redemption. Leviticus, the book of worship. Numbers, the book of wanderings. Deuteronomy the book of fulfillment, showing we worship a God of second chances. He makes good on every promise. You know there's more than creation in Genesis, but it would be good for every one of you and everyone you have influence over to just memorize those five words, creation, redemption, worship, wanderings, fulfillment, and understand that if that's all people buy into, it's enough of a foundation to say, I need to get the rest. If it's true, we're not an accident. If it's true, we were created by and for God. Well, I need to know him. If it's true that we've sinned against our holy God, well, I need redemption. If it's true, and it is, that we were created by him and redeemed for him, we certainly want to worship him. And then there will be our wanderings. Between here and heaven, we are wandering in the wilderness of sin just like they did. It doesn't mean we're sinning in the wilderness. It just means we're living here where things are far from what they should be and could be. And then Deuteronomy, it's fulfillment. It's, it's a, God shows us our God is a God of second chances. Well, many of you have walked this road with me. Some of you have gone through our uh, Jesus from Genesis to Revelation series, still highly recommended. It will walk you through and point you to Jesus in every book of the scriptures. But Genesis basically breaks down into four major events and then four people in one family. Creation followed by the fall, then the flood, and then the foolishness of Babel. Creation tells us how we got here. The fall shows us how we ended up in the mess we're in. The flood, how God deals with unrepentant sin and how he rescues people who put their faith in him, even in the midst of those judgments. The foolishness of Babel, after all that that happened, uh, it's so important to see it. They build this giant monstrosity toward heaven thinking, well, we're going to worship, but they weren't trying to worship the true and living God. You don't need to go up the hill to do that. You can do that wherever you are. You just need to make sure you're worshiping the right God. From creation to the fall, to the flood, to the Tower of Babel, to four generations in one family. And I pointed out many times as we walked through it or make reference to it, 
But, well, God is more concerned with family than he is all those other issues. Why? Well, he did all those other things, but they're just, they're just, well, they're just uh, things that happened and, and things he engaged with people in. But this family, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, they are the foundation of an entire nation. And, and they give us picture after picture after picture that point us to Jesus. So Abe, and it all started with him, he was promised a land, a nation, a name. In fact, he said, a great nation, a great name. Reciprocation, blessing those who bless you and cursing those who curse you. And then a savior in your seed, all nations will be blessed. Those promises, see, are enough to know. And that book is enough to know. Okay, we were created by and for God. Our sin has separated us from God. The flood is what happens. Judgment comes to the unrepentant. Salvation, though, is available to whoever puts their faith in him, as Noah did to the saving of his family. The foolishness of Babel is just a reminder. Everybody's worshiping something or someone. But only God is worthy of our worship. The family of God, what they were, well, we are today. God didn't write them off. He just set them aside for a while. But he still has his eye on Israel. His heart is for Israel. That's why that little swatch of land is the most, well, it's the most debated and, and you know, warred over and fought over piece of property on planet earth. Exodus is the book of redemption. And by the way, Exodus is the truth about slavery and freedom. Those are issues today as they've always been. Men have always and do today enslave their fellow men. Why? Because the hearts of men are deceitful and desperately wicked. Duplicitous. That just means men are capable of sinning and convincing themselves that's not sin. Of doing the worst things possible and convincing themselves it's not that bad. Well, who knows the heart of man? Only God can see it. But the word of God can reveal it. Men enslaving one another is horrible, but even worse, all who are slaves to their sin. And in Exodus, we get to see how God frees both. The word was heard, believed, obeyed. We walked through this just a couple weeks back. I believe it was a couple weeks back in, in the book of Acts, those later chapters. The Passover lamb was slain, the blood was applied, and the firstborn in every household where the word was heard, believed, and obeyed survived. The worst possible bondage and slavery is to our own sin and to our own sin nature and yielding to that instead of yielding to him and finding cleansing and forgiveness in the blood that Jesus shed for us. Our Passover lamb sacrificed for us. Well, that led to life for all of them, all who heard, believed, and obeyed, just as hearing, believing, and obeying God's word today leads to life for all who are dead in trespasses and sin, freedom from slavery to other men and to our own sin nature. Leviticus is the book of worship. If you've ever read or began to read, and we're going to recommend it once again because, well, a new year is just around the corner. And I am sure there are a lot of people that are looking forward to 2021 for a different reason, just want to see 2020 over in the hopes that what lies ahead is better. And so it's important to note if you, read, if you read Leviticus, it can kind of get, well, wearisome. It, there's a lot of repetition. There's all sorts of sacrifice. There's all these things. But when you understand it's a book of worship 
And that from the get-go, from the very beginning, God shows us in his word, worship doesn't just involve sacrifice, it requires sacrifice. First mention of the word is when Abraham took Isaac up that hill. I mentioned this a couple weeks ago, but not in this context. They went up that hill to worship. How was he going to worship? He was going to obey the Lord and offer a sacrifice. That sacrifice looked like it would be his son, but that was just a picture to point to the one who'd actually give his son, who would die for our sins, buried and risen again. Now, it was a picture, and it was an opportunity for Abraham to demonstrate to us and to all who ever read his story how someone who is so unsure and so insecure and, and so fearful of the enemy that he does unthinkable things. And, and yet when you get to the New Testament and you read of Abraham, those things in, in the book of Hebrews, he doesn't talk about Abraham's failures or his failings. No, he talks about how Abraham walked by faith, how Sarah conceived by faith, how all these things happen by faith. It's true that we falter and fail. But if we're walking by faith, when we stand before him, that's what he is going to be focusing on. So the, the, the desire for fellowship with sinful men that's what Leviticus is about, God's desire to fellowship with sinful men and his plan to make them acceptable to him. The burn offering, the grain offering, the peace offering, the sin offering, the trespass offering, they have these in common. They're offerings that confess, I am a sinner and I want to be right with you, acceptable to you, forgiven by you. And so that's what that book is all about. All of those, all of those, the burnt grain, peace, sin, trespass, and others in the book of Leviticus, they're all fulfilled in Jesus. They all point us to the one who atoned for our sin so we could be free from it. Well, book of Numbers then. Oh, if you're interested, in, and I do hope you read through the scriptures this next year, you don't have to wait, by the way, till January. If, if you're um, not getting out much and, and it looks like they could clamp down again and things could get even more difficult for many, well, good thing to do when you've got nothing else going. Don't turn on the TV. Don't listen to the news. Open your Bible. Read the word of God. Start in Genesis. Read to Deuteronomy. It actually doesn't read to and through Deuteronomy. It actually doesn't take that long, but will benefit you greatly. So uh, after the laws related to and God's words related to worship and atonement for sin, there are laws for the priest and for purity, for the people and property, feast and festivals, worship and vows and such. Book of Numbers, the book of wanderings. 40 years wandering in the wilderness of sin. Why? Because in spite of the fact that they were brought out of bondage with God's mighty hand, these guys walked in unbelief. They died in the wilderness of unbelief. I know we touched on some of this, so I'll just, but you know, for the sake of those who hear this topical study, it's so important to say it. What they went through, what Israel went through, a whole generation perishing in the wilderness of sin because they didn't believe God. They refused to inherit the land that God promised to them. And Deuteronomy then brings us back to the reality that God always keeps his promises. And when one generation says no, he'll say to the next generation, go. And the, the generation they said they were worried about actually inherited the promises, actually inherited the land, actually lived in the land promised way back when to Abraham. Well, it's the fulfillment as God makes good on all his 
promises. Moses' last words to a new generation, Deuteronomy, as they prepare to enter the land. The key, believe God and obey God. Well, blessed is the man we read who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf shall not wither and whatever he does shall prosper. These are word pictures, so let me, let me uh, amplify them for you. He shall be like a tree, living, growing, thriving, each becoming just what God created it to be and providing just what he created it to provide. A tree planted by the rivers of water, nourished by God's provision, its roots go deep. It soaks up life-giving water. Then it brings forth its fruit in its season. It's fruitful, reproducing according to its own kind. There in Genesis, we see that everything God created reproduced after its own kind. And everything that's alive has the ability to reproduce itself but always after its own kind. Well, not just that. He says its leaf won't wither and whatever he does will prosper, vibrant and useful. Jesus tells his disciples at one point, you didn't choose me, but I chose you and I purposed that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain. Not just chosen and fruitful, but producing abundant, abiding, lasting fruit. Fruit of the Spirit, most of you aware, some of you knew. Love, joy, peace, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And within the fruit of that Spirit, fruit of the spirit, which is in heart, love, all those other things uh, they follow. We're filled with joy and peace and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control because we've been so loved by God who gave his son so we could live. Contained in that fruit is a seed to reproduce more fruit. That's how he makes it happen in nature. That's how he makes it happen in us. The ungodly, we had to get to them eventually, but I saved them for last and we'll share the least about them. Why? We used to be them and we don't really need to go back to what we were. We need to think about who we are in Christ and, and what he has for us, what he's purposed and planned in these last days for each of us and for our families. But if you're not yet in Christ, you need to know that God put you in the category of the ungodly, of the unrighteous. That's why this is blessed and fruitful and righteous because that's how he describes all who are in Christ Jesus. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind drives away. When they grew wheat, there were two parts of it. There was the part that was actually useful and fruitful. And then there was the part that just, well, it was useless. And you didn't want to mix the two. So they would try to get to high places where there was wind. And then they would just throw that stuff up. And the, the wind would blow the chaff away. The wheat would remain. And he's saying the ungodly are like that. They're just blown away carried away by every wind of doctrine and every foolish idea and every expert who says, hey, this is how it is. Like the chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. It's important to say he's not saying this doesn't mean the ungodly won't be judged saying they won't survive God's judgment, nor will they stand with us and all who are justified by faith in the congregation 
of the righteous. They won't stand the judgment or in the judgment, but you will. And by the way, your works will be judged and you will be rewarded for things that you could have never done were God not working in you and through you. Rewarded for the goodness he poured out on you. And so it's telling us they won't stand with us all who are justified by faith in him. That's the congregation of the righteous. In Matthew 13, Jesus likened the wheat to sons of God and the tares, the chaff, to sons of the enemy, the evil one. That's important because pop theology says today, well, everybody's a child of God. No, God says that's not the case. You must Be born again. According to who? What expert? Jesus. I would say he's the only one I can absolutely be sure about. He's always right. And so the, the, um, the, the picture is, well, we are children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Born again of his spirit, adopted into his family. We will forever belong to him. But the sons of the evil one, the enemy, they will forever be separated from him unless. Here's the wonderful thing. God makes it possible for the dead to receive life, for the blind to receive sight, for for the deaf to hear the things of God, for hearts to be changed and lives to be transformed. For the Lord, verse 6, knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Psalm 1 began with the word blessed, and it ends with the word perish. That's important. Why? God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. There are some who say, well, God's will is that some perish. I don't find that in scripture. It says it's not his will any perish, but all come to repentance. Will people perish? Will people spend eternity separated from God? Yes, but not because he didn't love them or provide for them or reach out to them. Everyone makes a decision. And if you've never decided for Jesus, I encourage you to do that today. If you've decided for him, Well, then get in his word and let his word get in you. Live for him, for the days are short and judgment's coming. Gather all who you have influence over as Lot was instructed to do and pray they don't mock you, but they listen and receive the forgiveness we found in Christ Jesus. Jesus promises finally a harvest of the godly and the ungodly, a resurrection of the just, those who've been justified by faith in him, and the unjust who remain dead in trespasses and sin. We started with blessed is the man. Here's a couple more. Psalm 32 begins with these words. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is uh, covered. Psalm 33, 12, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he's chosen as his own inheritance, heirs and family of God. We were once that kind of nation. Can we be again? There's hope and, 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 you know, the possibility in him. But while we can't turn our country to the Lord, we can turn our family to the Lord. It starts with us, then our family, then our fellowship, then our community, because God always starts at home and then he works out from there. And so I pray that we will, as a nation, once again, worship the true and living God, that we will turn from our sin and put our faith in him. Jeremiah 17 And I'll conclude with this. Blessed is he who trusts in the Lord, whose hope is in the Lord, safe and secure in him. Blessed, fruitful, righteous, joyful, thoughtful, beautiful, successful. That's the way of the blessed. Lord, thank you for your words of encouragement to us. 
And even as we consider, we were created by you and for you, and only our sin can separate us from you. Not things done to us by others, not the lies inflicted on us daily, bombarded by media that just doesn't know what they're saying and, and what's true. Lord, we can only be separated from you by our own sin. And you've promised once we surrender to you, you'll never leave us or forsake us. But Lord, we know we can break fellowship with you. We can fail to enjoy the salvation we have in you, this, this family experience we we receive because we're in Christ Jesus with millions of others who believe in you to salvation. Lord, we thank you that you so loved us and first loved us and proved your love for us by going to the cross. And you said it, Lord, greater love has no one than to lay down his life for his friends. And Lord, we know you tell us we can prove our love to you by simply walking in obedience to you. If you love me, keep my commandments, you said. And we ask you to strengthen us in our desire to do just that. We pray for every backslidden Christian, for every weary and worn soul, for, for everyone who's, well, in that place today where they don't know if they'll be living tomorrow. We pray, Lord, for those in that place who don't know you. And we pray for those who do. For those who don't, that they'll come to know you. For those who know you, that they will be secure and at peace and at rest, knowing when they breathe their last here, they'll breathe their first in your presence. We're so grateful, Lord, for your word to us today. Your word is truth. Saved by grace through faith, that not of ourselves, the gift of God, not of works, lest any should boast. We're so grateful today, Lord, and we pray not one who hears these things will perish. And if you're in this auditorium with us and you've never given your life to the Lord Jesus or you're anywhere in the sound of my voice or you can see uh, me sharing these things, I want to ask you right now, if you've never given your life to him to do that, today. You just need to confess you're a guilty sinner just like us and that you believe Jesus died for each sinners and for your sins specifically and personally that he was buried and rose again. You turn from your sin, that's repentance. You put your faith in him. That leads to the gift of everlasting life, salvation in our Lord and Savior Jesus. And if you've never done it, I want to pray some words. I want you to pray aloud after me. Feel free, believers, you can pray along. But if you've never given your life, pray these words after me. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving me and for revealing yourself to me, for convicting me of my sin, for convincing me of your love, and for pointing me to your son, Jesus. He gave his life for me, so I give my life to you for now and forever. In Jesus' precious name, amen and amen. Hey, if you're anywhere in the building or outside, overflow or the outside overflow or gathered here and you gave your life to the Lord, make sure you come up after. We have Bible for you. I want to welcome you to the family of God. We have a short clip about Operation Christmas Child. And uh, as it's finishing up, we'll return and then we'll worship together yet one more time. Rob. <laughs>